Hello and welcome to Shemanus United Church for Sunday, March 21st, the fifth Sunday of Lent. My name is Reverend Elise Feltrin, and I'm so glad that you found your way here to be with us today in worship during our church online. We gather with words from the 51st Psalm. Put a new heart in me, O God, and give me again a constant spirit. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and strengthen me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. O God, open my lips and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. And with these words, we light our Christ candle to remind us of God's spirit ever present with us. And we enter into our worship with the sound of the singing bowl. Timeless God, your radical message of inclusion is countercultural. You promise us welcome and belonging if we dare to open our hearts to discover siblings in Christ, in each other. May the cry for justice, dignity, and equality be the song we sing harmoniously. Guide our lives with the power of your all-encompassing love. In the name of the liberating Christ, we pray. Amen. And as we always do at the beginning of our service, we pause for a moment of confession just to reflect on the ways in which we may have been distant from God in the past week. As a people traveling through life together, sharing the journey of faith through these weeks of Lent, we seek God's presence in our lives. We recall those who have been a part of the covenant with God in the past, Noah and the hope in the rainbow, Abraham and Sarah on their journey to a new land and new beginnings, Moses and the struggle to find freedom out of slavery. Now we hear anew the promise of a new covenant, the promise of new life and wholeness for all. But we tend to cling to the past. We are afraid to let go and open ourselves to new possibilities. Help us, gracious God, to embrace your covenant and the promise it holds for one and all. In silence, we confess our personal needs to you, O God. And friends, be assured with these words from the book of Jeremiah, God declares, I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sins no more. All thanks be to God. Amen. On the screen, you'll see the words for a new creed. Please join me in saying them. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating and has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Our next hymn will have words on the screen. It's uh, from Voices United, number 578, As a Fire is Meant for Burning.
This morning, our first scripture passage comes from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. The Lord says, the time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Although I was like a husband to to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach a neighbor or know the Lord because they will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. And our gospel reading picks up in the book of John, where Jesus has arrived in Jerusalem with his disciples. It's John chapter 12, verses 20 to 33. Some Greeks were among those who had gone to Jerusalem to worship during the festival. They went to Philip, he was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and the two of them went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has now come for the Son of Man to receive great glory. I am telling you the truth. A grain of wheat remains no more than a single grain, unless it is dropped into the ground and dies. If it does die, then it produces many grains. Those who love their life will lose it. Those who hate their own life in this world will keep it for life eternal. Whoever wants to serve me must follow me so that my servant will be with me where I am and my father will honor anyone who serves me. Now my heart is troubled and what shall I say? Shall I say, Father, do not let this hour come upon me? But that is why I came so that I might go through this hour of suffering. Father, bring glory to your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have brought glory to it, and I will do so again. The crowd standing there heard the voice, and some of them said it was thunder, while others said an angel spoke to him. But Jesus said to them, It was not for my sake that this voice spoke, but for yours. Now is the time for this world to be judged. Now the ruler of this world will be overthrown. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to me. In saying this, he indicated the kind of death he was going to suffer. May we find wisdom and hope within these words. Amen. During this season of Lent, as part of my spiritual practice, I've been reading this book by Gail Boss, Wild Hope, Stories for Lent from the Vanishing. It's a beautifully illustrated follow-up partner to the Advent devotional, All Creation Waits, that I mentioned back in December, with original black and white woodcut portraits illustrating different endangered creatures. Each short story laments the struggles of one individual species to survive, ranging from the popular well-known koala and polar bears, to leopards and elephants, to the less cuddly diseased bats and disappearing frogs and creepy crawly salamanders. And then there's the downright obscure, like the uh, mysterious unknown critter like the Olm, O-L-M, which lives in the deep, dank darkness of Eastern Europe's underground streams, yet serves a vital purpose there, purifying toxins out of the water. Meant to be read over a six-week period, this book is subdivided into six sections recounting agonizing tales of those animals who are hungry, sick, homeless, poisoned, hunted, and desecrated. The 40 stories are both fascinating and heart-wrenching because each one of them chronicles the demise of 40 different imperiled creatures. 
The Christian author once tried to use uh, the story of Noah's Ark to teach her children about Lent, applying the analogy of the Ark as church, safely carrying us through the roiling waters of our lives. As her blank-faced sons stared back at her, she realized she had missed the boat. They wanted to hear about the animals. But sadly, neither scripture nor the church offered any wisdom on the symbolic value of the animals on this earth, from the majestic to the microscopic, or anything about the integral relationship we share as co-inhabitants of God's good creation. And so she created this book, and uh, as she began to reflect upon the suffering inflicted on animals by humanity's lifestyle choices and consumer demands, she finally realized that attention to our amazing ark mate is actually the direct route to the heart of Lent. As climate change and human population expansion continue to cause a global wave of animal suffering, Boss writes, it has indeed taken me to the white hot core of Lent, where I've felt broken open and sick at the revelation that the way we live is each year killing millions of magnificent, innocent creatures of all kinds. She continues, so I've had to see and confess that my habits of body, mind, and heart aid the slaughter of God's beauty. These aren't comforting bedtime stories. They are distressing stories about death. And today, the story of Jesus turns toward death. With his disciples, he has arrived in Jerusalem Crowds of Jews, Greeks, Gentiles, and others are gathering for the Passover festival, and we know we're heading towards Palm Sunday and Holy Week. All roads are leading to the cross. Jesus admits, my hour has come, and begins speaking to his followers about death, sharing the familiar words of a grain of wheat needing to die and fall into the ground in order to bear fruit. But let's be honest, we don't need to learn anything more about death. Most of us know all too well the grief and the suffering that arise from death. As typical adult human beings, all of us, including Jesus' disciples and all those followers, have seen our share of death. We have all seen loved ones die. We've heard of strangers dying. We read of animals dying. None of us is exempt from dying. And we can do nothing to avoid the cold, hard fact that death is a part of life. What we need to hear, what the disciples need to hear, and what Jesus proceeds to teach is how God transforms death into new life. It's challenging to apply the parable of the grain of wheat that must die in order to live to these heartbreaking stories from the animal world. But it's there in the monarch butterflies who migrate thousands of miles to the cloud forests of Mexico in overlapping generations, the females laying eggs and dying on each leg of the journey that their subsequent offspring will complete. We see it in the story of the black-footed ferret, the rarest mammal in North America, whose survival depends on killing and eating prairie dogs where ranchers have plowed or poisoned entire prairie dog colonies, the ferret too has disappeared to the point of extinction. Educated ranchers are now learning about the important symbiosis between these two species, and it eventually they've allowed ferrets bred in captivity along with new prairie dogs to be reintroduced on their ranches, repopulating the plains. Yes, many prairie dogs become ferret food, but it is ultimately to the benefit of the entire ecosystem. As part of the circle of life, animals too die. 
But it's hard to imagine any benefit whatsoever to the complete elimination of any one species. Yes, they die, but is there a need for them to totally die off? To the credit of author Gail Boss, while her disturbing stories of endangered species are alarming, the book's title is Wild Hope. And she dedicates it to the scientists and the conservationists who are selflessly devoted to Earth's wild creatures, those people who commit not just hours but lifetimes to field research, patiently standing around in forests and deserts and bogs, gently collecting eggs and putting on tracking collars, intently watching and documenting animal behavior, tracking their movements, studying their habits, often studying their stomach contents, but most importantly, then sharing what they learn and observe so that the wider human population can understand the way our human lives are intricately connected with all species. And perhaps helping us come to understand that what needs to die in our own habits and behaviors might cause other creatures to be able to continue living. What must we learn to hate about our lives in this world in order to bring about the much needed change to provide life abundant to all creatures? Returning to the words of Gail Boss, the purpose of Lent has always been to startle us awake to the true state of our hearts and the world we've made, which makes an aching wild hope that something new might be born of the ruin. The promise of Lent, as articulated by Jesus in his parable of the grain of wheat, is that something will be born of the ruin something so astoundingly better than the present moment that we can barely imagine it. Lent is seeded with resurrection. The resurrection promise that a new future will be given to us when the hard husk suffocating our hearts breaks open and we feel the suffering of any creature as our own. That this can happen is the wild but not impossible hope of all creation and the wild but never impossible covenant promise of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, thirsting for you, my God. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, thirsting for you, my God. Thirsting for you, my God. O God, you are my God, and I will In the shadow of your wings I cling to you, and you hold me high. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, thirsting for you, my God. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, thirsting for you. Thirsting for you, my God. Through the day you walk with me, all the night your love surrounds me. To the glory of your name I lift my hands, I sing your praise. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord. Thirsting for you, my God. My soul is thirsting for you, O oh Lord. Thirsting.
thirsting for you, my God. Thirsting for you, my God. I will never be afraid, for I will not be abandoned, even when the road grows long and weary. Your love will rescue me. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, thirsting for you, my God. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, thirsting for you, my God. Thirsting for you, my God. Let us pray. Creator God, from mysterious polyps of coral to mighty and graceful whales, from families of human-like bonobos to dragon-like olms, from fragile yet feisty monarchs to foraging albatross, the seas, the skies, and the earth are filled with your uniquely beautiful creatures. And for this, we give thanks and praise. Whether covered with fur or feather, scales or skin, we all strive to find shelter and food, to care for and nourish our young. In different ways, we form supportive family units. We communicate, we feel, we play, we love. Yet, God, we alone have been set apart as stewards, not to dominate, but to serve your creation. Break open the husks of our human hearts to reveal how we are interconnected. Hear our lament about the ways in which we have mistreated and misunderstood our winged and four-legged and other abled siblings. Help us to identify ways in which we can change our behavior and lifestyle so that our choices do not have such negative impact. You, O oh God, not only promise, but continually reveal new life emerging from death in the seeds that grow from darkened soil, the offspring that hatch from dormant eggs, the hope that springs from places of despair. As our Lenten journeys continue through wilderness time, help us to find the living water in the desert, which only you provide. Bring your healing grace upon all creation and work through our human hands to protect and preserve all people and creatures in peril. In silence, we name these personal concerns. And we trustingly lay them before you, God, praying to you as taught by the crucified and risen one. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We have a special uh, minute for stewardship from our treasurer today, so I invite you to listen to Elaine Can. Hi, I'm Elaine Can, and I'm the treasurer of Shemanus United Church. I've been an active member of this church since I moved to Shemanus five years ago. One of the reasons I love being involved is because I've always felt very welcome here and I feel the church is an important 
part of the whole community. It feels good to be a part of something that makes a difference in people's lives and creates a caring presence in the community. Even during COVID, the Harvest House Food Bank continues to operate out of the basement and AA meet here weekly. Other things have moved online, like our weekly worship service and Zoom coffee hour and Tuesday morning prayer group. And our committees continue to do important volunteer work, sending cards and phoning to check on people, participating in outreach projects concerning the environment, refugees, and local poverty issues. The faithful work of Shemanus United in the world and in the community has not been put on hold by this pandemic. And so I'm here today to thank you for your continued support of Shemanus United, especially during the, these hard times. Your gifts are greatly appreciated and have allowed us to keep doing the good things that we are doing. I also want to encourage you to continue being generous with your offering to the church, whether that be a one-time gift from a viewer in appreciation of the online worship services, or to honor a special celebration, or to remember a loved one, or an ongoing monthly contribution by pre-authorized remittance. If you are already on par, I invite you to consider increasing your monthly amount to keep in line with the annual cost of living increases to all our regular church expenses, which is usually about 2%. Our office continues to be open Wednesdays and Thursdays to receive donations dropped off in person, or you may mail checks payable to Shemanus United Box 71, Shemanus, BC, V0R1K0. Every donation is eligible for charitable receipts. Once again, on behalf of Finance Committee of Shemanus United, a heartfelt thank you for your faith-filled and hope-filled giving. Your support truly does help our church to touch and change lives. And we pray over all of our gifts that we offer and share. The gifts that we offer are signs of our covenant with you, O God. Our time, our talents, our treasures shared out of gratitude. Blessed to become further blessing to the world. From the abundance we offer, may renewal, new life, meaning and healing be brought to all your children and creatures. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. And so go forth from here, beloved friends, in the wisdom and promise of the new covenant with this good news to share with all. God's love is indelibly stamped upon our hearts, tattooed on our souls, imprinted upon our spirits. We are God's people. We belong to God. May your path from here be guided by such love in mutual service to one another and to all God's creatures. In the name of the one who embodied love, taught love, and lived a life of love, Jesus the Christ. Blessings upon blessings. Amen. <laughs>